Let me know in case for some of you still not awake yet. It's time to now. <laughs> and today's, this week's Bible studies are the same. Men's and women's are on Tuesday nights. The women's here, the men's at the Bible Shack at 7. And Friday mornings, the ladies have a Bible study at 10, 10? 10? 10.30. And Wednesday night, we have a prayer meeting, a gathering here, where we say prayers for our community, for our brothers and sisters, and for the nation. And you're sure welcome to come and join in on that. Would you please stand as we say a prayer for our Lord for Thanksgiving for being here. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this gathering, for this opportunity you're giving us. Would you open our hearts and our minds that we may be accepting what you have to teach us this day, that we may take it to practice and take it to our hearts. And we thank you so much for this blessing, Jesus. In your name we pray. Let's start singing, How Great Is Our God. Or 
just one house? Or we don't know. Yeah, well, this you should have known about this. It's right below us. Dave and Jenny are in the past drivers. Oh, oh, I know who you're talking about. I drove down that way the other day. He's got all these whirly gigs and stuff. That's the silliest thing. Right? Yeah. But he's got some trees down right in front of us. Focuses on how great God is, how big He is. You know, our the reality is what worship is about is understanding how small we are compared to how big God is. You know, my arms aren't long enough, my brain's not big enough, my my words aren't eloquent enough to talk about how great God is. There is a place that does talk about how great God is. And one of them is Psalm 145, 3. I'm going to go through a couple of verses real fast, and then we'll settle on Genesis 1-1. But Psalm 145.3, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Sounds like greatness, doesn't it? Um, what we see in our world today is that people try to destroy God's greatness by... Uh, They, one thing they do is they deny his greatest achievement, creation. Um, there's a lot that we're trying to eliminate God as creator. They'll say, okay, this is an incredible world, an incredible universe. First of all, there's no God. Now let's sit down and figure out how all this came about. And remember, there's no God. We have an open mind and let's figure out how this happened. Um, you know, when Paul... Paul was preaching on Mars Hill, the Areopagus. 
and he was preaching to a group of pagans, people that worshipped all kinds of false gods, but they didn't know the true God. And so how does he introduce the true God? He says in Acts 17, 24, the God who made the world and all things in it. Okay, is Paul right? Yeah. He's, he's accurate. This isn't uh, literary style. It's not allegory. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. And then Job 38, 3 and 4. This is God challenging Job, where Job was kind of wandering off a little bit. It's also, it's a good challenge for any unbeliever. God just says, verse 3 and 4 of Job 38. Now, this is God's sarcasm. I think you can see it when it comes. Now, gird up your loins like a man. And I will ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Um, God's going, I built this. Um, don't take this away from me. Genesis 1.1, turn there. Let's take a look at this. First book of the Bible, first chapter in that book, first verse in that book, first words in that book. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not allegory or anything like that. God created the heavens and the earth. You have to either say, I believe it or I don't believe it. You can't sit on the fence in this one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the, God, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning. One day. You know what? The whole, he created in one day a whole universe of matter and energy. Light is it's electromagnetic energy. So he made a universe full of matter and energy in one day. Then the rest is just... Just details, you know, just finishing it up, using the same parts. And um, incredible complexity. Just think about, you know, evolutionists struggle with this. Think about just going from a lizard to a mouse, a reptile to a, a mammal. All of a sudden, they've gone from three-chambered hearts to four-chambered hearts. <clears throat> How do you do that in small steps? Each, you know, is there three and a quarter and then three and five eighths hard? Um, small steps, each step is better and more robust than the last one. Otherwise, it wouldn't survive. So you've gone from three chamber to four chambered, cold blooded to warm blooded. Tell me about that. You know, how does that work? The metabolism changes completely, the, the body chemistry. Um, the mouse feeds the babies with milk. Um, they appear. You better get that right or the babies are going to die. Um, you don't gradually ooze from one to the other and each one's a better step. Um, each baby step is an improvement. Um, again, Psalm 145.3 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. Okay, praise and worship are the only proper responses as we begin to understand God's greatness. That's the proper response. Um, you may notice the theme, how, how great is our God. Next song is How Great Thou Art. Mm -hmm. I see a pattern. Um, <laughs> great is thy faithfulness. Just ponder God's greatness and practice stretching your arms out how big God would be. Well, you don't have to literally, but compared to how big you are. Okay. Let's pray. Lord, I just I thank you for your greatness, Lord. I pray that you would open our minds, open our eyes um, so we could see more of your greatness and understand that our world is challenging that and it's not true. I pray that you would help us to rest, rest in your arms, knowing that you're in control, you're the blessed controller of all things. Lord, I, I pray that as we continue worshiping you in song, that we will genuinely worship, and as we switch over to worshiping you in the word, that we will continue worshiping. We thank you for all of these things in your 
We ask them in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Please stand if you would and join us in singing How Great Thou Art.
next song is Great is Thy Faithfulness. God is great. <laughs> Chapter 28 is where we're going to be this morning. And I'm going to be reading 16 to 20, but before I do that, I want to, I want to pray, as I'm sure many of you heard this week, um, Shirley Keller lost uh, her husband on Tuesday, and um, I just want to Take a moment to pray for her, pray for the Keller family, and ask God's blessing on them as they make the arrangements and seeking to walk through this together as a family. So let's pray. Our Father, Lord, I, I want to thank you so much for Stan's life, 
Thank you, Lord, for the many, many wonderful memories that this family has of this man. God, you tell us from your word that you are the God of all comfort, and you comfort us in order that we may bring that comfort to others. So, dear God, I do ask that you would give a great sense of your presence and peace to this family, Lord, as they make arrangements for services and, Father, just seeking what life looks for them next. Father, thank you for their, their presence in our church family. And I pray we would continue to be support to them, lifting them up in prayer, Lord God. And I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to begin at verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, if you would, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going right back to Matthew. Matter of fact, if you don't want to turn, I'm just going to read it and then go back to Matthew. But Ephesians chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand <clears throat> that we should walk in them. Brothers and sisters, we have an amazing salvation. The salvation that is ours in Christ, I try to find new ways of saying it every single week. And my words, like Dennis was saying, we don't have the, the reach, we don't have the, the reach with our words to, to wrap around the glory of the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. Just sometimes when I'm having a bad day and I'm a little grouchy and the next cup of coffee is too far away... <laughs> and you're just wrestling with things, and you're a little bit irritated, sometimes the thought comes to my mind, I should be in judgment right now. I should be enduring the wrath of the living God right now. And I am not, and I will never, because of his grace. The salvation that is ours is... Superb. But the interesting part is that after he saves us, then he decided, he decides, he calls us to use us in the endeavor of carrying this saving message to a lost world. See, this is the, the whole the whole thing is mind-boggling to me because it kicks off with a sovereign God making the choice to save us. Okay, that's that's unbelievable. Now, if we, were, if we were sweet and kind and worthy of saving, then you got something. But we're not. 
We're a bunch of lost people with wrath in our own hearts towards God by nature. Those are who he's saving and rescuing. But then after he saves us, then he calls us to go and be used by him, to partner with him in the endeavor of sharing the good news of the gospel. It, it's grace upon grace. It's mind-boggling upon mind-boggling. When I think about the salvation I've received, it is overwhelming. And then on top of that, the Lord says, now that I've rescued you, now that I've saved you, now that I've made you alive in my son, I will now equip you to go and herald this message out to a lost world. Not only herald the message, but I will use you to make disciples. If you have your Bible, turn with me if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is an exposition of Matthew 28, but I'm trying to set the stage here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 16. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us. Listen to this. Let me, let me slow down. Verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What is that? Verse 19. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us, entrusting to us, the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin. So the Father made the Son to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. So now we come to Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Not a good one, not another one, the Great One. And so if you look at verse 16, just to give a little brief context. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Please notice, guys, in the text, right off the bat, the obedience of the disciples to go to Galilee, to go to the mountain, Jesus had directed them to go. They're stepping in obedience. They're walking in obedience to go where Christ had called them to go. And we have two aspects here in these people. Worship, and what's the other one? Doubt. Ever found that fascinating in the passage? And some doubt it. Now, the text doesn't say who the some are. It doesn't say if it was the disciples, or even which disciple. And so I want to be careful here to just say I know who it is, or why they're doubting, or who they're doubting, or how they're doubting. All of that is not in the text. All we know is that in the passage, we're told they went, they're coming to Christ, they come up to Jesus, and they begin to worship. But some were doubting. Here's a couple possibilities, okay? Doubted by other disciples besides them. Some commentators believe, well, perhaps, perhaps there were some other disciples with the eleven, and those were the ones who had doubt in their heart. Another is, they doubt still in their heart a bit. Even the eleven are still struggling a bit. And then one commentator said, and I thought, that's pretty simple, but it's possible, is that they were doubting it was Christ, because in the next verse it says, he came to them. So perhaps as they're walking, some doubted it was even him. Possibility. I don't know. I don't think it's that far-fetched to think that because of the trauma of what these men went through to see a crucified Jesus, 
then a resurrected Jesus, that they still wrestled in their heart. Could this be real? Remember, these, these, these disciples did not become perfect men in this moment. They still had wrestlings. They still had struggles. They still had doubt, I would imagine, as they come up to the Lord Jesus. But regardless, to set the tone, as they're approaching him, that's what the author tells us. No doubt a myriad of emotions going through these men in these times. You think about what, what they had viewed up to this point, as they had seen Jesus for three years with a powerhouse of ministry where he could stop anybody, move anything, bring people back from the dead, and then they watched him pierced, and he didn't stop it. Nobody stopped it. Somebody stopped this. Even when Peter tried to swing the sword and stop it, Jesus himself said, you stop and let them have me. And then they watched him. Awful moment after awful moment of his crucifixion. Like a, a separate knife to their own heart, over and over and over, as they watched what they did to the body of their Lord. Trauma. And then to see him resurrected, to doubt that in their hearts, no way. These women are not telling us the truth, and then they race to the tomb. They find the empty tomb and eventually have a conversation with him. They see Christ, the resurrected Lord. I don't know about you. I, I, the, the more I see what's happening in our world right now, the more I don't believe the account of people. <laughs> when they come and say, this happened, I go, well, we'll see. Maybe. I have a lot of doubt about what I hear. And look at these guys, what they just saw, and then somebody comes and says, he's risen. No doubt that they would have some struggle with that. But nonetheless, as they approach him, they go where he said to meet him. They go up to the mountain, and there is the Lord Jesus Christ. And now what we're going to see is as Christ approaches them, he's going to do three things. Uh, in my mind, three things. We're going to see the authority of the commission we're going to see the details of the commission and the comfort of the commission. So the authority of the commission, the details of the commission, and the comfort of the commission. And so let's look at the authority behind the commission, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What makes a commissioning, when somebody comes and they give a task to another, they commission them to go do something. What gives that value and power and authority is the one doing the commissioning. Okay? So if, if Dan Mason came to your house this afternoon and I said, I'm going to commission you to go and visit with the President of the United States and share the gospel with him. Go. How far will that get you? Maybe out of Cloverdale. <laughs> There's, I don't, because the first question you would ask is, on whose authority? Uh, why, Dan, why would I get to go in front of President Biden and share the gospel with him? Why would I go do that? How could I go do that? Simply because you told me to do it. See, you, you want some authority invested in you from the individual who's commissioning you. That's how it works. And so it doesn't surprise me in the least that Jesus is the first thing out of his lips is all authority. The authority of the one giving the commission makes the commission. Confidence and comfort for the one being commissioned is found in the one who's doing the commissioning. So if I told you, I want you to go speak to the president, share the gospel, so on and so forth, and you said, Dan, I, I, I can't until I say, well, actually, he's my uncle. He's going to be over at my house. And I told him you were going to come by. Does that change some things? You bet it changes some things. You see, there has to be something behind the person who's commissioning the other person to go and do this. It is not about the authority of the one being commissioned. This is so vital to this, beloved. It is not about the one being commissioned. 
It's about the authority of the one commissioning them. As, as they slip off that ring and say, you take this ring with you and that will get you through. Or uh, here's a stamp on this piece of paper. Here's your orders. You take that orders with you and you show that authority and that authority will get you through. When you get pulled over by a police officer, if you get pulled over by a police officer and he comes up to your window and you take out that driver's license, what you're saying is there's authority behind me, behind this wheel. And if that's in crayon, you are going to get a new pair of handcuffs. <clears throat> But you're showing the authority behind the commissioning to enable you to go and do it. What Jesus Christ is doing here is he is laying out the credentials that back this commissioning. So Jesus says, because here's the question. All right. He's about to commission them to go out and do this. Jesus, I have a question. On, on what authority can I go and devote my life to that? What what do you have that could enable me to go with great confidence and joy? What do you have? How could you empower me to go and do that? And Jesus doesn't mix words. He says, all authority. Now, I looked up both words, all and authority. What it means is all and authority. <laughs> Where? Where? In heaven and on earth. In other words, everywhere. Jesus has authority in heaven and on earth. All authority. And please know, has been given to me. This isn't the first place you see this. Um, let me find my notes here for just a second. Turn with me to John 17, if you would. John chapter 17. He reiterates this same statement in what I like to refer to as the Lord's Prayer. I know we call the Our Father the Lord's Prayer, but this is really the Lord's Prayer. This is where Jesus is praying. John 17, verse 1, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you, so you being the Father, have given him, the Son, Jesus, authority over all flesh for what purpose? To give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're doing a little bit of Bible study this morning, you guys, moving through a few other passages, but I want to show you there's scripture behind this. Philippians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 10 and 11. Well, let's pick it up at nine. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, not will be, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And one of my very favorite passages in the New Testament, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Colossians 1, 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything, in everything, he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, 
who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, there is an already not yet category, and I'm moving back to Matthew 28. I encourage you to do the same. There's an already not yet category here in reference to the ruling and reigning of the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, we are still looking for the return of Christ and where he will rule and reign, of course. But I just ask you to notice, guys, please, please pay careful attention to your Bibles that the text does not say all authority in heaven and earth will be given to him in the future. That is not what the passage says. The Bible says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Not, not, not future tense. No, this is done. The Father has given authority to the Son. Why is that so important that our minds get wrapped around that? Because of what he's going to say next. Because of the text and the context. Therefore, if you notice down in your Bible, it says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So it'd be interesting if a, if a general is telling somebody below him in rank, he's going to tell him to go do a task. And he says, Soldier, I want you to go do this. Says who? Says me. Well, who are you? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Boom! Shut him down cold. When the, the passage, once again, the Lord used call to worship and the sermon, they dovetail beautifully. When Job comes to the Lord, who are you? Let me tell you who I am. Have a seat, young man. And so when Christ is here, he, he, he is... Showing the disciples once again. He's shown this so many times. He has shown power over death, power over nature. Guys, goodness, Jesus told the wind to stop. What'd the wind do? It stopped. You imagine that? Just some nasty storm out there and somebody says, knock it off. And the wind goes, I love the response of the disciples was not, dude, that was awesome. Their response was, we're sinful men. Because they were in the presence of a holy God. Well, Christ is giving them great clarity of his authority for the sake of great comfort in their text. See, this is the part, beloved, that is hard for us on a practical level day to day when we're living in this life is that we, we can buy into the lie that we are alone in this endeavor. And sometimes when we're within the presence of other believers, we can find strength in being in the presence of other believers. I want this passage so much to grab a hold of your soul this morning. What is giving us confidence to walk in obedience to this commission. If you're looking to yourself, you're looking in the wrong direction. Where you look is verse 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And there's a multitude of passages I could throw out to you. Ephesians 1.11, that he works all things after the counsel of his will. Romans 8.28, all things are working together for good for those who love God and called according to his purpose. There's just verse after verse after verse. Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases. Verse after verse that tells us there is one in control. And it's not Dan. It is the living God, and Jesus says, the Father has given all authority in heaven and earth to me. Therefore, now here we go, ready? Look at, look at your Bible, verse 19. Now the ESV says, go therefore. Some other translations say, therefore, go. And unfortunately, at times in, in past, folks have read that and they have run with the go. 
I want to run with the therefore. And I'll explain what I mean there in just a second. When you're reading your Bible and you see the word therefore, don't ever forget you want to ask what the therefore is there for and go back in the context and ask the question, what's behind this? What's driving this? Remember, what's driving this is the verse we just looked at where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, or in light of the fact, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me, here's what I want you to do. Now, here's what I love. Jesus doesn't say, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me, therefore I'm going to go do something. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me, therefore you're going to do something. So you see, it's Christ's power that he is, he is emboldening the disciples with his authority, with his power. Jesus in this passage is not necessarily saying he's going to go somewhere. He's commanding them, but he's commanding them on the power of him, not of them. Now, some folks have taken that word go, and in times past, you, you may hear somebody at a summer camp or something where they say, therefore, go. Therefore, you need to go. Wherever you are right now, you need to stop going there and go to, and then fill in the blank. You need to go to Africa. You need to go to a foreign land. You need to go. But God's command is go, go, go. That's not the verb in the text. A, a better translation would be, as you're going or in your going. Because the concept is not the command to go. It's in your going, and then here's the command, make disciples. See, the, that's why we've got to be so careful. The going is going to happen because you're going to come in contact with unsaved people. You're going to come in contact with all kinds of saved people. The going just naturally happens. I go over to the grocery store, go to the hardware store, or perhaps the Lord lays heavy on your heart to go to a foreign country as a missionary to that specific spot. I'm not negating that. I'm just saying there's nowhere in the text where I can twist the arm of a Christian and say, see, God says, head over to a foreign country. That's not what the passage says. Rather, what it's saying is, as you go, or therefore, in your going, make disciples. All right, there's your commission. Now, he's going to explain it a little further, and I'm going to walk through the rest of this text, but there's your commission. That's the commission on the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a multitude of, of passages in the New Testament that speak this very thing. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 would be the first one I would, I would take you to. But not only that, not only would I show you particular verses that show disciple-making is your commission— I would show you that the very nature of the early church in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament, but also the whole church, the whole history of the church has been making of disciples. Going into the world and making disciples. Please notice, beloved, the passage doesn't say, go into all the world and make converts. Do you know why it doesn't say that? You are not capable of doing that. And that's not your charge. You don't save people. That is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. The text specific is very specific. Therefore, go and make disciples. Disciple is a very, somewhat of a simple word. It, it simply means a pupil, a student, a learner. Now, please, please don't, please don't miss me on this, you guys. I'm not saying, therefore, do not be evangelistic. I'm not saying, therefore, don't preach the gospel. I'm not saying, therefore, don't share the gospel with your neighbor, with your family. Of course. Of course. I, you, I hope you know me better than that. Those of you who know me, I, I would never say, therefore, don't share the gospel. No, of course share the gospel. Just don't take the credit when somebody gets saved because it's not your credit. It's God's credit. And so as we go out, we herald the good news. Somebody comes to Christ. Then we take them in. We, we, we begin to pour our lives into them. Therefore, go and make disciples. Who do we make disciples of? Americans, right? That's what the passage says. People who live in Pacific City. It's interesting that it says all nations. There's a few different pieces to that that's fascinating. I won't <clears throat> spend too much time on it. I just find it interesting that Jesus is saying this to a group of people and up to this point, you have heard, basically, we're going to the Jewish nation, going to the Jews, going to the Jews. And then he says, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. Now, um, 
I could show you a few spots throughout the Old Testament where the Lord did go specifically to Gentile people as well. But obviously we see God opening and widening, using the Jews, going to the Gentiles, and drawing them in collectively. That's what would have been in the minds of these fellows as they heard it. Now, when we hear it, we may think like, you know, like I said, Africa or, or some other portions of the world. We go, i got to go out to the nations and, and spread the gospel. For sure. They probably would have heard this, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. We mean like Gentiles? Yes. Yes, like Gentiles. I want you to go and get them. I want you to bring them in. I want you to make disciples of all nations. Go to the people of this world and herald the message of the gospel. This is what's so beautiful, you guys, when you get to go to a foreign country and you get to share the gospel, you get to meet other brothers and sisters in the Lord, and you go, they love the exact same Christ. Amazing. Same gospel, same Bible, same Jesus. So many differences in our cultures, but the exact same Christ. So he says, go and make a disciple. What does that look like? He gives two pieces here. And it's interesting, there's, there's a lot involved in the second and one kind of idea involved in the first. So, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. It's baptism and instruction. Baptism and teaching. Now, as we come into the New Testament, what we see is when people come to Christ, we see them baptized. We see them go under the water. This is all over the place. After they're converted, they're immersed in water. I, I'm, I know that there's debates. Oh my goodness, how much debate in church history over baptism. My perspective is that baptism is a outward showing of the inward work that has taken place at conversion. So they're converted to Christ. They come and they're in the sense of a ceremonial washing, which was not a new idea. That was practiced in the Old Testament as well. And as they go into the water, they are showing, I, was, I have died with Christ out of the water. I've been raised to newness of life in the Lord Jesus Christ as a sign and symbol that I am born again. Just like when we come to the communion table, there's no magic in the bread, there's no magic in the juice. It's a sign, it's a symbol to show the blood and the body of Jesus Christ as we do that together publicly. And so when we see that practice, folks come to Christ, folks are baptized through here and throughout church history. I know there's differences in reference to children of believers. I'm not gonna go there just for time's sake. That's just another part of church history and a debate on baptism. That is not my perspective. This practice of baptism is a public profession of what has taken place in the heart of the individual. And the second one is teaching. I find this one so special, probably because I get the opportunity to be a, a preacher and teacher in the church of Jesus Christ. The teaching of the word, the expounding of the word, but here's what's so awesome about the command from Jesus in this passage. Please notice he didn't say, teaching them to know everything I said. That's not what it says. What's the word? Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. In other words, knowledge and obedience go hand in hand. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, so that, yes, they, they hear it, they understand it, but they're walking in obedience to it. Just plain knowledge, Satan has plain knowledge of theology. That's a far cry from observing and walking in obedience to the truth. And notice it says, to observe all that I have commanded you. Everything Jesus had taught, and I believe that that widens to the whole scope of the scripture because Jesus constantly was opening up Old Testament texts. He constantly referred to the Psalms and the prophets. He constantly referred to the book of Moses. He was referring to the Old Testament continually in his teaching. And then as we come to the New Testament, we see the apostles expounding that which the Lord Jesus taught. You have the canon of scripture being said here. Beloved, this is the task, this is the commission, is as we share the gospel, people come to Christ, 
They come into our lives. We then invest ourselves into them. We see them go into the waters of baptism. We see them with a hunger for the word of God, that the spirit of God starts to produce this fresh hunger. I can remember in high school, sitting down, up, down at my little desk up in my room, and there was my Bible, and I started reading my Bible, and I remember being conscious of it enough that my thought was, why do I want to read this? I was raised in a Christian home. I, I read Bible. I memorized verses. I did all that, Pioneer Clubs and all that. I, all that yes, but I had this thirst that came from, now you know what I mean, from nowhere. Because I couldn't attest it to a human being. I couldn't attest it that I was trying to win an argument. I couldn't attest it to maybe I need to make somebody happy. There was a fresh thirst for the truth and the God of the truth. And there was nobody I could look at and say, I'm doing this for you or because of you. It was spirit-given that I had that hunger and that want for the Bible. Because I wanted to know my God. I hate, I hated reading as a kid. I would do anything and everything to get out of it. The lawn needs to be mowed, Mom. Let me go do that. I didn't want to read until I found someone I loved so much that it was worth reading for. And man, oh man, it took a hold of my life. Beloved, as we pour out the word, let us be so careful not to hide portions of the word from this world. A quote from my friend Mark Kennedy, we should never apologize for the word of God. Don't ever, ever apologize. The word. State it boldly, stand with it, and chips will fall. Finally, the comfort of the commission. Jesus says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is what's so beautiful, is at the beginning it starts with all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Then he gives the details, go and do this, and then at the end he says, you're not going alone. I'm coming too. I think of like a little kid going, but dad, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I'm coming too. And the, the incredible comfort of Jesus Christ saying, I am with you always to the end. The omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God. He is with you to the end of the age. He remains the power source of your ministry. And so the presence of Jesus the presence of the Father, the indwelling of the Spirit of God in the midst of this commission is marvelous. I am way out of time, guys. Let me, let me finish. My heart's desire in bringing this message was three. I want you to have a fresh sight of the commission. I want you to have a fresh calling to this commission. And I want you to have a fresh confidence in this commission. I want you to see it afresh. I want you to feel, this is yours, not, not Dan's. Don't ever just slough it off to a preacher. This is on you, Christian. And have utter confidence, because the one who has authority in heaven and earth is the one who says, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, why would he say that unless he's saying, in the midst of your work of making disciples, I'm right there with you in the work. Beloved, there are many, many different tasks laid on us in this life. I'm a local pastor, I'm a chaplain of the sheriff's office, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a friend, kind of. Many different things that we give our lives to daily. Please notice, this is the Great Commission, not a commission. So who are you discipling? And who's discipling you in your life right now? And I close with one last simple thought, and then I'll pray. I just want you to look at the text at some point later today and be reminded that never in the passage does Jesus make it an option. Go, therefore, and make disciples. This is not optional. If you are his, this is your commission. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that we would have fresh sight of what this commission is. 
Father, a fresh understanding of what it is. A fresh calling, Lord God. This is what you've called us to. And Lord, please, please help us not to look in the mirror for our hope. But to look to you in those times where we may feel so scared in the midst of a family member, a neighbor. Oh, Father, help us to remember that the one with all authority in heaven and earth has commissioned us to do this. And Lord, you are with us in it. Please bless PCBC, God with a heart for making disciples, to be faithful to this task. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you please stand and join with us in singing Count Your Blessings. It's a great song. Continue the great theme. around us as those either needing to be encouraged in you or, or need to have you. Lord, we ask these all these things in your name. Amen. 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 Amen.